start, okay? I'm going to start this chapter. Okay, chapter seven, financial assets, okay? Financial assets. So in this chapter, <clears throat> we are going to talk about, first, what are financial assets, right? So we're gonna talk about the definition, okay? And then we are going to talk about classification of financial assets into seven categories, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna classify a financial asset into one of the seven categories. And the um, uh, accounting standard, accounting treatment is different for each category, okay? There are seven categories. Um, we are going to talk about, okay, this is assets, right? We want to know how to concern about the valuation on the balance sheet, okay? So we're gonna measure it, right? So what are the measurement approach um, that is appropriate for each category, okay? Um, and then um, we focused, our focus in this chapter is uh, three categories, okay? Uh, fair value through profit or loss, fair value through OCI, other comprehensive income, and amortized cost. So this is our focus for chapter seven, okay? The other four categories, uh, you are going to learn it in the advanced financial accounting, okay? So that's the time you are going to learn about the consolidation, okay? So in this chapter, for, this, for the purpose of this course, we are only going to focus on three out of the seven categories, okay? The last one is about, um, you know, applying present value techniques, right? You learned in the finance courses how to uh, calculate present value of uh, future cash flows, right? So we're gonna apply these techniques you have learned in finance course uh, to, uh, to account for the uh, investment in the debt instruments, okay? So bonds would be, bond would be uh, one um, type of the debt instrument. And in, the, in uh, 3101, in the next intermediate financial accounting course, there's one chapter you are going to learn about financial liabilities, okay? And you are going to, again, look into this, okay? So if you did a good job in this chapter, you should have an easier time uh, later on once you take on the, uh, the liability side of the, the issue, okay? So that's what are the uh, learning objectives for this chapter. Okay, so what are financial assets? Okay, what are financial assets? So financial assets, okay, arising from contractual agreement on future cash flows, okay, such as stocks, okay, and bonds, okay. So when we talk about financial asset, so in comparison, let's talk about the real asset. So what are the real asset? You think about equipment, uh, land, buildings, property, right, um, inventories. These are called real assets. You can touch it, right? You can use it, okay. Um, so these are the real assets, but the financial assets are different, okay? Financial asset is based on contracts, okay? Financial assets are based on contract, okay? And then there are a counterparty involved, right? A counterparty involved. So basically, um, okay, so if you have an investment into a bond, okay, that's your financial asset to you as the bond holder, okay? But for the bond issuer, for the company that issues the bond, it is a financial liability, right? So do you see that? You are the bond holder and there's a bond issuer, right? So there are two parties, right? This is a contract. Um, this bond, because you are holding the bond, is an investment to you as a bond holder. Uh, so it's a financial asset, but it is a financial liability to the bond issuer, right? So, um, so this is quite different from the real asset, right? So for the real asset, there's no counterparty, right? You purchase the equipment, you purchase the factory, you bought a machine, right? That machine is yours. You have the ownership. You can use it to generate revenues, right? So there's no counterparties on the real assets. Right? But for financial assets, um, it's based on contracts. There is always a counterparty, okay? 
Okay, so uh, do we have any questions in terms of the definition of financial assets? No, no question? Okay. Uh, sorry, I got a question. Okay, go ahead, Mitch. Uh, does his intellectual property, is that considered an asset? Uh, intellectual uh, property? Yeah. Yeah, that's an asset. Awesome. Um, okay. Yeah, so it's a real asset, right? It's not a financial asset because there's no counterparty on intellectual properties. So if you're talking about financial assets, um, for, for example, right, you talk about it's my investment, but it's the liability of the other party. So you can, it's kind of like a mirror, right? Um, on your book, it's a, a con, on your book, it's an asset. On the book of the counterparty is a liability, okay? Intellectual uh, properties is an asset on your book, but it's not a liability. Uh, to the uh, on the uh, book of another party, so for financial assets, it's based on a contract. Okay, in that contract, it specifies uh, the future cash flows. Right? Maybe it's the interest you're gonna receive. Maybe it's the dividend you're gonna receive. Right? This is the future cash flows, uh, and then um, you know you purchase um, you know this contract. Right? And then uh, you, as a reward, you are going to uh, be um, you are going to receive future cash flows, okay? So it's your investment, it's the liability of the other party, okay? So intellectual properties, um, there are no counterparties. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that clears it. Thanks. Awesome, awesome. Okay, anyone else? What about um, a due from a related party? Would that be an, a financial asset? Uh, due from a related party? Okay, um, so that's, to me, that's more like a due from a related party. Um, due from a related party. Is this uh, kind of like a re receivable, probably, in nature? If, when you say due from a related party, so maybe um, it's, a, it's a receivable kind of thing. Okay. So if it's a receivable, then uh, it's a, a real asset. It's not a, um, it's not a financial asset. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, so basically, when we talk about the financial assets and the financial liability, which you are going to uh, learn in the next course, okay, in spring. So this is actually the the two sides of one coin. Okay, two sides of one coin. Like I said, um, if it's a financial asset to the debt holder, okay? And then it's a financial liability to the debt issuer, right? So there are two parties, okay? So that's kind of one way you, can, you will know that if this is a financial asset. You wanna think about it. Is there a counterparty? Okay, is there a counterparty? Okay, so the most important issue is about how to measure, okay, how to measure these reporting values on the balance sheet, okay? Uh, measurement basis, measurement basis. So, you know, uh, we always say uh, not one size fits all, right? Not one size fits all. Uh, this is the same idea, right? We have different uh, measurement methods, basis. So no single uh, basis fits all the financial assets, right? So back to the uh, beginning of the semester, we have learned about different m measurement method, uh, historical cost, uh, current cost, right? Fair value, realizable value, present value, right? Those, those are the, you know, the measurement basis, right? In chapter six, we just learned about the inventory, remember? We are saying the inventory, um, right? The, the finished goods inventory is reported at the lower of the cost uh, and the uh, net realizable value, right? So we, we have just seen how realizable value is used for chapter six, right? Uh, and so we're gonna see uh, more, you know, how we're gonna use present value, how we're gonna use fair value, okay? So the idea is, okay, 
there's no single measurement basis for all financial assets, depending on which category we classify the financial assets, okay? Um, so the classification depends on management intention for the investment, okay? What's the purpose of uh, having this investment from the management perspective? That intention, okay, that objectives will affect the classification of the financial assets, okay? And we're gonna see in the next slide what do we mean by that. Um, and then for each classification, okay, for each uh, category, the IFRS will have accounting standard, okay? And uh, there are gonna be a specific accounting treatment for each category, okay? Okay, uh, there are three general groupings based on nature, okay? Equity instrument, equity, okay? Debt, debt, okay? And derivatives, derivatives. Um, so what are the debt equity instruments, right? I think we all should be familiar with this. Uh, so that's basically you buy shares, right? If you purchase the shares of another company, right? Shares, right, common shares, those are equities, right? So if you have a contract, gives the holder the residual interest in an entity after deducting all its liability, okay? That's the equity instrument, okay? So, you know, the common share would be an equity instrument, right? Uh, derivatives, so in the finance courses, how much you have learned about derivatives? You probably have learned uh, I'm not sure if you are taking corporate finance. Maybe you have taken the personal finance. So for derivatives, um, some common forms of derivatives would be uh, future contracts, forward contracts, options, and the swaps, okay? Um, I'm not sure how much you learned in finance, from your finance courses about these contracts. Uh, so I will give you uh, one example. Um, what do we mean by derivatives? So this derivative is hinged on some, some kind of market value, right? So for example, uh, the future contracts, right? If I'm doing business with, uh, um, if, I, if my business have a market, market section in the United States, right? So I'm gonna need the US dollars, right? So, um, you know, uh, I have to convert it, the US dollars I received from the US customers into Canadian dollars, right? Um, because all my suppliers is in Canada, I have to buy using Canadian dollars, but I sell to, to US customers, I'm collecting US dollars. So then one of the business risk is about the, uh, the exchange risk, right? So, um, you know, what I'm concerned that, um, you know, I use Canadian dollars, right? But what, by the time I get back the US dollars, what if the US, do, uh, US dollars um, has a low value, a low exchange rate? So I cannot get back uh, as much Canadian dollars as I want, right? So those are kind of exchange risk, right? And uh, it's beyond your control, right? Um, so then what you can do is, okay, what you can do is uh, you want to go to the market to draft a contract with people saying, guess what, I'm going to, okay, exchange, um, I'm gonna do a, a US dollars exchange uh, from US to Canadian dollars with you at a specific specific rate, okay? Uh, and then, um, you know, you know I, the rate is fixed, right? It doesn't matter how the market, market rate changing. Um, you know, we have a contract, you know, we specified the rate for the transaction. So in that way, you know, I'm protected, right? I'm not too concerned about you know, the US dollars depreciating, right? Uh, why the other parties wants to do this with me? Well, the other parties is concerned uh, the other way, right? The, the US, the other party is concerned that US dollar is going to, um, you know, uh, going to the opposite direction, right? Because people speculate. If I'm concerned the uh, currency moving in one direction, there are some other parties in the market. They are concerned about the, the currency exchange rate moving to the, in the other opposite direction, right? So then we agreed with uh, fixed value, right? You know, so in that case, uh, you kind of manage the risks, right? So 
so that's a but that's one example of derivatives, okay? So this contract's about uh, locked in the exchange rate, okay? That's one example of derivatives, okay? Um, Would you leave it up to the company you're in a contract with to exchange? Like if they wanted American dollars, could you exchange American dollars and then tell them that they have to worry about the exchange rate? Um, so what happened is your company is collecting US dollars from the customers, right? Yeah. And uh, depending on business cycle, suppose you have to uh, make a purchase on March 31st, right? So that's the time you have to convert all, all your US dollars into Canadian dollars, right? Uh, but now it's December, right? You don't know how the uh, exchange rate is going, right? Which direction is going. But you are, con you are concerned is going to be against you. So therefore you locked in an uh, interest rate with another party ahead of time. So then you are not taking that, the downward risk. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, okay. thank you. No problem. Um, can anyone maybe comment how much you learned in finance about derivatives? Have you learned anything about derivatives? Yeah, learned uh, a bit. Uh, okay. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, so. Like call uh, options and put options and that sort of thing. Yeah, call options, put options, right? All those stuff. Okay, very good. So those are the derivatives, right? Uh, and then debt instruments, right? Debt instruments. Uh, so one example would be bond, right? So if it's not an equity uh, instrument, if it's not derivatives, then it's a debt instrument, right? So a typical example would be a bond, right? A bond. Okay, so that's kind of the three general groupings based on the nature of the financial assets. Equity, uh, debt, or derivatives, okay? That's the three general groupings. Okay, uh, strategic uh, equity investment, okay? So you think about, uh, BN, uh, sorry, what is called ANW, right? ANW is a fast food restaurant, right? Uh, they are their main kind of selling point is about, you know, um, we are using like um, Canadian beef that are free of hormones, right? Things like that. Uh, so that's kind of their selling point, right? Uh, maybe like one of their strategies, right? Uh, you know, they support the Canadian economy and uh, they, they, they are concerned about the health of people, right? They are, the quality of the food, right? So then maybe one strategy for them to go is maybe they should just, uh, you know, uh, invest into some uh, farms, right? Growing the beef meat, right? So in that way, they would have influence in those operations to make sure they are not using hormones, using uh, all the chemical stuff, right? In the, uh, in the feedings, right? Um, so in that way, right? You know, they are not concerned, oh, what happened if, you know, you know, uh, the, there is a kind of competition in the market. The, there's a shortage of beef. Well, I'm not concerned because I have my own. I invested in the factory, in the farms, right? I have secured all these uh, uh, supplies, right? And I, I, I'm also uh, ensured the quality of my, uh, my beef, right? So strategically, you have reasons to invest into, uh, you know, another company, right? Uh, so then you can have influence, right? Right. If you own 60% of the company, right, you are the big boss. So you can influence the decision makings, right, for that operation. Okay. Uh, so basically there are, depending on the degree of influence, there are four categories. Remember, we, talk, we are saying there are seven categories, right? Um, but for strategic um, investment, equity investment, there are four categories. So there are subsidiaries, joint operations, joint ventures, and associates. Okay, that's the four categories. And voting power is the determining factor, right? Even though you own 60% of the company, okay, if you have no voting power, right? Uh, it could happen depending on when you invest into the operation, if the original founder, founder 
uh, wants, still wants to make their own decision, right? So then in that case, uh, even though you probably own 60%, but you can only have influence, right? You don't have control, right? So um, this is the four categories, okay? So what do we mean by this, okay? So subsidiaries means control. So the ownership of the equity should be more than 50%, okay? It's important to know that if you own 50%, that's not a control, okay? You have to own more than 50%. Even 50.1%, that's a control. But 50% is not a control. Um, and then joint operation, okay? Uh, it's a joint control, okay? And joint ventures, it's a joint control. Uh, investment in associate companies. So in this associates, it's a significant influence when your ownership is between 20 and 50% inclusive, okay? If your ownership is between more than or equal to 20%, okay, then even though it's under 50%, you know, it's a significant influence, okay? Significant influence. This is called associate. So uh, you have a, a, a whole course, okay? Uh, 4,000 level course, advanced financial accounting to learn how to deal with this, okay? So for example, for subsidiaries, okay? You are going to use consolidation method, okay? How are you gonna deal with the subsidiaries? You are going to use consolidation and you have the whole course to learn about it. Uh, for joint, joint control, okay, joint control, um, this is the uh, proportion um, consolidation, okay, proportion consolidation. And uh, for the associates, you are using uh, equity method, okay? So you have um, a whole course to learn the details about uh, how to uh, do the accounting treatment for the strategic invest equity investment. Okay, that's the first four categories. Uh, so in this chapter, uh, in, for the purpose of this course, we are only focusing on uh, FVPL, that's the fair value, the measurement at fair value through profit or loss, FVPL, um, and measured at fair value through other comprehensive income, FVOCL, and number seven, measured at amortized cost. Okay, measured at amortized cost. So that's the seven categories. Uh, we are going to focus on the last three categories. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to stop.